Hey there, silver people. Uh, Tim TK here with Fat Silverland Show on Tuesday. Uh, we are uh, having some technical difficulties with our co-host here, so hopefully uh, McKinsey can join me. If not, um, I also have an open invite to the general Silverland chat, so maybe someone else may pop in from our Wednesday or Sunday shows, um, or even maybe just a whole new face altogether. If not, that'll just be me. Uh, Aaron is out at the moment, uh, along with Quentin, and Jose is on vacation. So right now it's just me holding down the fort. Uh, but tonight's topic is talking about marketing. Um, uh, particularly now that we're in the age of digital marketing, and that's kind of you know what the show is. And I guess a little bit of background on what I do outside of write comics is actually do marketing content for uh well other companies but now primarily i work uh with an hvac company as their uh content marketing strategist writer person thing um so that's my background in marketing what i what i currently do for uh, a day job uh which is nice because it allows me to actually write full-time so if you're uh looking into writing full-time but you don't have uh big best-selling book deal uh you look into content writing uh you essentially just write blog posts a day or write sketches for uh social media posts or emails it's actually pretty nice uh, even if it is all about uh heating and ventilation and air conditioning so uh talking about marketing comics specifically uh we're gonna be talking about uh what this kind of show is, what our online presence is, and uh, how other companies do that same thing, and, and the general terminology for it, and I guess the strategies therein. Uh, so I guess I'll start pretty broad spectrum. Uh, you have generally for online marketing, digital marketing, you have what's called inbound marketing and personality driven marketing. Uh, rarely ever now do you see the traditional print style of merit marketing or um slam marketing uh, i mean sometimes you might see something where someone like down talks a competitor or they uh you'll get the, the random odd post that's uh hey did you know that we're great for xyz um mostly it's uh, you'll find marketing happens in ways that's almost more subtle than that that's kind of the goals people don't want to be sold something. As a consumer, I know I don't want to be sold something. I want to buy something. So I want something that's going to tell me how best I can I can buy something or how best I can be an educated consumer therein. And you know, half of this is going to be me vamping until someone else pops in. But if they do or don't, that's great. Uh, I can talk about this. I probably won't take a full two hours. If it's just myself, I may only talk for an hour or so. Uh, so we're going to look at primarily at inbound content or inbound marketing or content marketing and personality driven marketing. Um, so examples therein, uh, this show and our Wednesday show and our Sunday show are examples of uh, personality driven marketing. Let's see there. Oh, Curtis, well, Curtis Vegeta will be joining us. Uh, but yeah, our live streams are, are examples of personality driven marketing. Uh, the idea being that um we as a publisher don't want you to be buying comics from faceless soulless corporations um not throwing shots but uh we want you to buy comics from us personally we want you to feel like you know us and that you can trust us and uh hey thank you mckenzie <laughs> uh mckenzie is, is currently dealing with some network issues but she is watching so uh if anyone else is in chat say hi uh, so personality driven marketing, we want you to feel like you you know us a bit more, and they want to actually want to get know you, get to know you as our readers. Um, and this solves kind of two metric issues. One is it allows us to have a direct point of connection with uh, the average reader or the average fan. So instead of relying on oh, there's there's Quentin. Da, da, da. Yeah, Quentin has joined us. Sorry. Uh, no, no, you're all right. I'm late. <laughs> you're fine. But uh, as I was saying, uh, uh, two major forms of, of marketing in the online era are inbound marketing or personality marketing. Talk about how 
these shows are, are, are a form of personality marketing that we're selling it based on who we are as personalities and that uh, the two major analytical things that this allows us to fulfill is instead of relying on surveys on the back of issues, uh, it gives us direct uh, connection with the uh, the audience. Yeah. The other thing is that um, it gives the audience a uh, direct connection to the artists behind the the work itself. So instead of having to, uh, you know, go through uh, a, a shop listing and have the attendant, you know, dig up all the issues with certain names attached to it. If they, if they like the, that, then there's a more direct line of us don't know exactly what we're working on. Uh, how long do you get to know your readers? Uh, how long is too long before producing a product? Uh, well, uh, Ideally, you want to have a, uh, a product that's ready to go as soon as you start marketing, uh, because especially now, people, uh, when they decide to make a decision to buy something, they want to be able to buy it. Uh, again, they don't want to be sold yep. something, uh, because being sold something it takes away their agency in that decision. And also, um, you know, you already have the stereotype of the sleazy used car salesman, but they want to, to know that they're making their own decision. Uh, that they've done their own research on it, and then they want to be able to act on it immediately. Uh, that being said, I did just pre-order three hundred dollars worth of plastic from Games Workshop for Horse Heresy. Um, but uh, how do you get reviews? And that, I mean, with personality-driven content, it's as simple as uh, posting conversation pieces. So uh, having you know open conversations like this, or if you're on uh, Instagram or whatever, uh, just being willing to talk to people. So either posting a question in your feed or uh, having kind of an open-ended subject and, and then having that direct communication with there. So uh, it's as simple as just, you know, communicating either verbally or through writing. Uh, I agree. And don't get too salesy, mm -hmm. uh, like you were saying, because, you know, I don't, I don't want to talk somebody into buying, you know, something. I mean, I, I, I mean, there is a level of that, you know, mm -hmm. you want to tell them what it's about and everything, but I don't want to like, uh, I don't want them coming away from it feeling like they got something they really didn't want. You know? Yeah. Uh, any tips for engaging people at cons? Uh, yeah. I mean, that's probably something that we'll get into in a, on, on another uh, uh, episode down the line. Uh, but yeah. Um, it's kind of the same thing where you want to distill the actual pitch of it down to its, its bare bones. Um, you know, the idea of the elevator pitch is that it's one or two lines that you can shoot out in less than a minute. Um, There's a then, lot of different ways to do that, too. I've heard several different ways people have pitched their stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, who is it that uses the... You know, there's some people that use the movie, you know, oh, yeah. well, it's a little bit of this movie and it's a little bit of that movie and, you right. know, yeah, uh, I always uh, uh, archetypes. So when you're doing, um, uh, uh, I think it was like Honor X Blade. It was in, it's uh, possessed demon samurais fighting ninjas. Uh, <laughs> you know the, the basic archetypes were, were interesting enough that it got people in the door. Uh, uh, and then you know it is a, a lot about. Um, you know, making that conversation from there on. If someone has a shirt that you have a similar interest in, like if I saw someone wearing a Destiny shirt, I would absolutely bring that up if they're walking by. Or, uh, yeah, you know, I, I I favor people, you know, uh, that I identify with. Uh, sorry to breast in on you there. No, uh, I, I I favor buying stuff from people that I identify with. Like if they if we if I stop and and we talk, you know. Mm -hmm. And I get to know somebody that makes all the difference in the world to me, you know, but oh, yeah. if I stop and somebody's like talking really fast and they're like, you know, come on now, if you get it right now, you get blah, 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 you know, mm -hmm. yeah. there's a certain amount of that, you know, I don't mind. Cause I know it comes along with the territory, but you know what I mean? I mean, uh, I just, uh, find it a lot, a lot more fun, a lot more, uh, you know, to organically do it, you know, just being personable and Hey, what's going on? You know? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's me. Definitely, and and to bring it back around to content marketing, that's kind of the idea is that we want to. Well, I guess this is a, well personality driven marketing is we want to uh, essentially make it entirely about the personality behind the actual product. Um, yeah. So uh, for these streams, you know, we talk not just about you know 
the craft of it all, uh, which we'll get into with uh, like content marketing. But also, we just talk about our interests as well as we have, you know, open game days, which we have another one coming up later this month. Um, we will be having a, a game day episode because uh, Jack's Films has put out a free game in the style of uh, Jackbox games. So we'll be hitting that up. Um, uh, but it's we want it to be uh, it, this form of personal networking usually exists for people who are already within the ecosystem of your service or your product. And it's a way for them to feel further ingrained in, uh, I hate being a corporate jargon person, but the culture of your business. <laughs> um, uh, it, it, it's so uh, cliche, but it's true. We, each business or each product has its own form of culture. And there is a Curtis Fujita. Uh, what? I know. Yes. I heard this is where the cool kids were hanging out. So I yeah, wanted no. to go. We're having a cool kid stream talking about marketing. <laughs> yeah, what stuff. made you yeah. think you could come? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I have money. I have money. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. that changes everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're talking about uh, online and, and digital marketing. So uh, uh, I haven't got into inbound marketing or content marketing yet, but talking about personality driven marketing. So okay. the idea of our, of our shows and what they're about, as, as well as, you know, just generally making stuff that is. About us as personalities connecting with the audience as personalities rather than as producer consumer. It's about, uh, you know, we're both, everyone here is a fan of comics, or at least, you know, why else would you be making comics? Uh, so it's about creating that, that interaction of people who like talking about comics and people who like listening to stuff about comics. Totally. Yeah. Uh, how much is too much as marketing goes? Back in the day, we had lavish gifts and the launch is fun people. What's the state of things now? Uh, that's definitely more of like a direct sales thing. Uh, if you have like a sales team working for business, that's that's definitely what what uh, they do to, to like leverage what are called whales. <laughs> uh, but um, as far as uh, marketing now is largely uh, a growth uh, vector, so it's about getting people in the door first before you can turn them into you know a whale or a profit puppy. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it's uh, that. Um, and now with how online marketing is, it's you almost want to be as minimally invasive as possible. Um, there's a great book called um, uh, They Ask You Answer. And uh, it, it goes into detail about a lot of, about a lot of how online marketing works. But the, uh, the weird thing is, is that before 2008, uh, Around 70%, 67% of the buying decision was made after initial contact with a salesperson. Hmm. Now, 60 it's it's inverted. 60 70% of the buying decision has been made before even contacting the provincial uh, seller of whatever, whatever person's buying. So whether that's a home improvement, um, general products, or whatever, you know, there's a reason. That there's a reason you don't have door-to-door -door vacuum salesmen anymore. <laughs> uh, it's because people do their own research and make the decision to buy before they even contact the person they're going to be buying from. Uh, and so having this minimally invasive, not, you know, you're, you're, you're not trying to make that, in, that contact. You're trying to offer either content or personality that uh, creates that sense of trust around what it is they'll be buying. Nice. Uh, yeah, so I already kind of talked about my background in, in as far as uh, marketing goes and, and uh, working uh, now as the uh, content writer and, and strategist with uh, uh, doing online content for an HVAC company. <laughs> um, but uh, Quinn also does, you know, uh, visual aspects of marketing as far as logo design, designs and everything like that. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, oh gosh, I just flipped my keyboard. Um, uh, Curtis, uh, how about a little bit of your background and, and what you do as well? Sure, sure. So, I mean, um, for me, um, as far as marketing, I mean, you know, marketing in general, you know, I mean, it kind of for me started with like well, having my own business, having my own martial arts school. Mm -hmm. So being a kind of like a one man show, it's like creating the website, creating the branding, you know, how, how do you market that, you know, and it, it's still it's still a it's, it's an ongoing process. Let's, yes. put, let's put it that way, you know. Um, but uh, but like even with with Silverline, you know, being the creative director, Roland and I talk about it. But it's like kind of getting like a visual style, 
of yep. this brand. You know, we were, we were talking early on about the, the color scheme for Silverline. And um, originally I, I chose blue for a lot of things just because it was on our website. And then mm -hmm. I mentioned it to Roland. Roland goes, oh, I actually like red. And so then <laughs> so <everything> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to, to, to being red, you know. So that's kind of um, my background, working in games, working in, um, in video games and stuff like that. Sometimes I would do the packaging design. Yeah and things you know so cool. like, yeah yeah so kind of kind of kind of all ties together the thing about it that i was like is um i read a marketing book once and they said if you're not aware if you don't take the time to create an image for your business mm -hmm. that in and of itself creates a get, creates an image and not necessarily a good one yeah and, and you're, you're creating an image whether you you think you are or not that's kind of the especially nowadays right with social media and whatnot. yeah that's my take on it uh so, Curtis is the reason we have red shirts. <laughs> uh, uh, Roland is by via Curtis. Yeah. 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 We're good as long as we're not uh, on the enterprise. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Uh, say. Uh, but yeah, talking about um, you know, kind of kind of what the, the purpose the, these shows have as uh, ways of, of getting our personalities to potential customers. Um, uh, so obviously while we do have episodes where we talk about the craft of stuff that will almost fit more into when you get to like content style marketing, uh, a little bit, but, uh, as far as, you know, connecting people with the personality, there's a reason that so many, um, companies now don't really spend money on print or television as much as they do with social media and hiring, uh not just a social media manager but a whole team of analysts and um uh what are called engagement specialists people who will spend hours just cramming out you know 140 characters worth of something to make someone click uh <laughs> what i think is the scientifically most efficient way to make someone click like on something um yeah and and uh you know so that none of that is is uh except for uh wendy's uh, none of it is really slam marketing. It's not really like sniming on uh, opponents. Uh, Wendy's does it; they'll ask companies to be dunked on. Um, but Wendy's is a whole other like study in social media marketing. If you go to a marketing class now, Wendy's is on the uh, <laughs> uh, the docket because of just how insane their social media has gotten over the last five years. <laughs> um, but a lot of it is just almost general conversational tones. So. Uh, as far as what you guys have noticed or what you guys have, have interacted with in terms of of, me, of companies on social media or on video presence, like either YouTube videos or what have you, uh, have you noticed that trend now to be more personality driven and more conversational? Oh, definitely. You see that that thing with the um, Old Bay seasoning? Oh, yeah. Oh, God, that was priceless. I mean, it was it was them versus, was it Peter? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, they were just going back and forth with, you know. So yeah, no, def definitely, definitely. You know, it's it's hard, right? Because I think the end goal is to be genuine, mm -hmm. and sometimes it comes across as kind of clickbaity and not, you know, disingenuous, right? right? So it, it's like a fine line. I, I kind of think like we were talking about Wendy's, like Jack in the Box, kind of had a great marketing kind of attitude and voice, yeah. you know, over the years. So definitely, yeah, yeah, definitely. What about my strategy uh, is to look as hungry as possible. <laughs> <laughs> Would you please, please <laughs> buy my comic, please? There we go. Show them pictures of my kids and have them photoshopped really skinny where you can see their ribs. You may see it. Yeah. You buying this comic could save my children. <laughs> Wasn't there like an Animal Man cover where they're like holding a gun up to a cat? It said, "Buy this comic or we shoot this cat." It was like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, well, bad a deal, uh, <laughs> bad a seal for a better deal. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Uh, and yeah, like, you kind of what you're talking about. Like, it's it's all about uh, coming off as being sincere. Um, uh, you know, you kind of have that. Yeah, I mean, we certainly we certainly are guilty of this, but you know, we also believe it. But if you ask any person who works in any business if they say that their the place they work at is different or special in some way, like 100 percent of people are going to say yes. Uh, <laughs> But also 100% of the people rely on the same thing to actually drive sales, and that is trust from their potential buyer. Mm -hmm. Curtis is hard zoomed on his face. 
<laughs> oh, no, I, about that. I, I was just like, whoa, hello. hello. <laughs> <laughs> that happened. <laughs> That was my that was my uh, very strong reaction. Let me, uh, there you go, yes. Let me <laughs> the reaction cam. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let me switch that out. Just Good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but no, every place relies on the same thing, which is is, is trust. And you and you're gonna trust something that feels more like genuine and sincere than you are going to trust the, the big soulless, just uh hard, hard selling company. Machine. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think anyone shops at Walmart because they trust Walmart. They shop at Walmart because it's convenient. Um, but yep. uh, I've given the choice to go to some place that you know people trust more. They're either the mom and pop grocers or oh, Curtis dropped. Uh, we'll get that figured out in a second here. But um, uh, you know there are uh, other places that I definitely have a stronger trust relationship with in those places I go to first. Um, Although I will say there was a time when people shopped at Walmart because. You know, Sam Walton was such a uh, personality. All mm-hmm. on, you know, uh, people really didn't mind because you know he was, yeah. you know, yeah, very, that, that, very awesome, personable guy. You know, yeah. And that came down back, it comes back around to uh, almost like an early iteration of, of personality driven marketing, where you make it about you know the, the name, the the band behind the name, mm-hmm. and you know that was also the same deal with uh, Henry Ford. Is that uh, yep, yep. There wasn't a whole lot of trust in automobiles, and especially American-made ones. When you know you had uh, uh, Europeans have been doing it for just a, a scooch longer, but when he had uh, Henry Ford start talking about, he's like, "Oh, I'm doing this, this, and this, and you know, I, I'm making the it more common man, yeah. the common man, so he can uh, afford a vehicle, you know, mm-hmm. uh, automobile." Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Have it resonated seen, with people. Have you folks seen the documentary called "The Century of Self"? Have you heard of that? I don't, a, I don't know if I have. No, I feel see. like we're in it, though. Yeah, <laughs> it's fascinating. It's it's basically about the beginning of um social of, of actually like social engineering for marketing. Yeah, people. and about uh, Sigmund Freud's nephew, I believe, was the mm-hmm. this guy that did that. And they were talking about one of the first things where he used like psychology and things like that, and psychoanalysis. To yeah, market, was um tobacco. So the mm-hmm. tobacco companies were essentially like women aren't supposed to smoke. Because uh, it was negative and considered uh, unladylike, and the tobacco companies in the U.S. were like, "If we can get women to smoke, that's like we'll double our profits." Because that's the yeah. other half of the world. So they went ahead and then got all these uh, debutantes and kind of like uh, liberal women and told the press that they were going to have a march for women's civil liberties and independence and women, basically women power. And they told the press that when they walked down uh, a certain street at a certain time, these women would light torches of freedom to symbolize their independence. And they gave all these women cigarettes. And when they rounded the corner in the press, was there, they all lit up the cigarettes, which were their torches of freedom. And it appalled everybody. <laughs> it was a sign of just of audacity and, and the power of womanhood. And then it became a symbol for women to smoke. And there you go. we got them. So. That's, it. That's super mm-hmm. interesting. Yeah. 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 So we need more people to be, read comic books. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just whenever, whenever so you get a bunch of people to march and then you're around a corner, we'll light up a cup. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> There's with, uh, something really special inside, and you just roll up the comic yes. book. Like so, and mm-hmm. there you go. Yeah. The first comic by Cheech Marin. Well, I lost an entire. But yeah, that's, you know, uh, and I was going to say, uh, yeah, and, and definitely, like, you still see that sort of same sort of impact uh, added into, you know, uh, when you get to bits of personality, bits of, of self driven stuff. Actually, let me have a brain blank out that you have to, I just have to mention this. Did you know what Sigmund Freud did before uh, he was a, a psychologist? No, what? He, he was a marine biologist. He oh, really studied eels. Uh, hmm. well, it was one of the guys who was trying to figure out. Because we don't we don't know how eels reproduce. That's a fun mm-hmm. fact I learned. We still don't know. Wow. Uh, and he's one of the guys who's trying to figure that out. And nearly <laughs> it made him. There are some letters about him writing about this, and it's just absolutely unhinged. Just like his reaction to trying to figure out eels, and he's like, "I'm just gonna go back to school and, and start studying people." Wow, <laughs> <laughs> that's insane. Um, but uh, you know, you have uh. 
bits of, of what's called shock value, essentially. And while it can be overdone to a point where people are like, oh, that's just gratuitous shock value, but it is something that, you know, when done well, uh, it certainly adds to the either the personality behind the name or uh, when you get to the the talking about content where it adds to the the depth you feel like you're getting from the content effort by that company. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, one of the biggest personality driven uh, things, even before online marketing is really a company, it was really a, a concept was Doritos. Mm. Uh, and because Doritos commercials were never about how great Doritos taste, because even they knew they were OK. Um, <laughs> but it's always about just the most uh, insane, like uh, uh, kind of energy filled way of supporting Doritos or eating Doritos. So he had the Super Bowl Dorito Samurai. <laughs> Remember that where he had a guy dressed up in full like uh, samurai kit made out of Doritos to attack people <laughs> in the locker room. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. My, uh, my sister worked for Procter and Gamble um, mm-hmm. over in Switzerland when, over there, and she was talking about the marketing how drastically different it was between uh, U.S. marketing for chips mm-hmm. and the American. And she goes, "You don't realize how violent our culture is until you're into yes. a marketing campaign for chips." And in France, it's like the same flavor, but they'll be like artisanal sour cream and onions. And the U.S. it'll be like kick you in your teeth, nachos, explode yeah. burritos, yep. you know, dynamite, this, mm-hmm. you know, heavy ballistic missile, cool ranch, you know. So this yeah. is <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> if a company did an ICBM cool ranch flavor, I'd be kind of into that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> what was that? What was that Starburst commercial with all those uh, heavy weightlifters, those oh, bodybuilders? Yeah. Yeah. The, the island of something. I thought that was that commercial was just hilarious, where everybody's screaming and yelling at each other. Yep. <laughs> uh, you know, if I have a cool name for a comic story, where can what work? Where, where do I go to see if it's already taken, or can I use a name that's taken and we are close? Uh, so you probably just Google, probably those that are uh, looking up on Comic Vine to see if it's you know somewhere that's been uh, registered there. Um, but there is you, and if it's been long enough, uh, you can take a name that's already been taken, depending. Um, there's been a couple comics that have been completely unrelated to different publishers, different teams that have had the same name. But usually there's more than a 20 to 30 year difference there to the point where the rights holders on the previous title either don't care or aren't around anymore. And you can also go to the, the U.S. Uh, patent office, the mm-hmm. U.S. PTO site. Yeah. Because when you get a when you get a trademark, it has to be for a, a specific uh, specific, not just the, the name, but for a specific actual enterprise. Yes. So, so um, you can I, I know this because for my comic book, I ended up doing that. And uh, we had to go back and forth, and it took a while. But you can go to their website and check it out. Yeah. Um, and uh, it also has to be uh, trademark is only applicable within, you know, like you're saying, within the enterprise, within that same market share. So that's why you can have, um, you know, enterprise, the ship in Star Trek, as well as, you know, uh, enterprise car rental. <laughs> Completely different, uh, like, uh, venues. Um and it completely is available to everyone because it's in public domain. Uh, you can also look up public domain. Anything in there can be used um, because it can it can no longer be claimed. So um, uh, Great Gatsby is well yet. So uh, I'm I've been juggling on ideas for uh, I've been juggling on ideas for either doing like a horror or like an ultra violent Great Gatsby, whatever, because it's public nice. domain. Nice. Um, one example of this also um, Winnie the Pooh has fallen into public domain oh, really? and there is a horror movie coming out about it about yes. uh, a group of masked murderers who just have, like winnie the pooh and the forest game <laughs> oh that's great that's yeah. great wow sounds like yeah. that was a pride prejudice and, and zombies like that yes. kind of that must have been what happened over there i would think yeah yeah exactly so yeah when something falls into public domain uh and uh lovecraft stuff was all published uh at the point now where it's falling out by doing i want to say it's like 80 years or 80 some odd years is when something falls in the bug domain since it's creation. Unless you can get special things applied to it, like Disney has done with Mickey Mouse, where they essentially lobbied for special protections around it. Yeah. Otherwise, Mickey Mouse would also be public domain. Uh, but I believe Steamboat Willie actually is. 
a Steamboat Willie version of him. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I believe that's how we got a uh, games like Kinky, but um, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, and you know, and certainly, uh, that sort of <laughs> when you're using something that has you know, public domain has been around for a long time, so it's usually. Uh, something that's been at least known in some circles. So when you can reinvent it in some way, that already adds you a little bit of impact and a little bit of personality to your product that you already have an ingrained marketing essentially that you don't really, that makes it a little bit easier when it comes to actually coming up with the idea of how you're going to sell it. I wonder though, how does that work? Perfect. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> uh, as I was saying, I've got that comment there. I already have uh, no less than 13 ideas for Cthulhu Comics. Go ahead, Brett. <laughs> Hit it. <laughs> Like, for instance, you know, like Miss Fury, right? Public mm -hmm. domain character. We have Silver Line has their version, you know. Yep. Malibu had a version. Uh, Billy Tucci released one. Is there any incentive for, like, let, at one point for there to be a champion Miss Fury team-up movie if Silver Line doesn't have the actual rights to Miss Fury or can actually benefit from it in that regard? Is, do you have any idea? I'm always curious about that, public domain. Oh, there he is. We're joined by Chief Wrangler, Rolling Man. Uh, so... <laughs> Uh, yes. So even though, like, uh, you know, there would be no exclusive rights to to something like a, a mystery because it would be in public domain. Yeah. Uh, you can still have uh, essentially intellectual property, uh, innate rights, or you know, because you don't need to file for uh, a trademark. You need to file for a copyright, but a trademark happens as long as there's intellectual property published or available in some way. Um, it's actually the other way around. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, it's one or the other, but yeah. So other yeah, way around. Yeah, because yeah. when you publish your stuff, mm -hmm. it's copyrighted. A trademark mm -hmm. is actually right because uh, the trademark is the the unique a mark. Yes, mark. Yeah. yeah. For, for, uh, so, uh, but so to say, you know, uh, it's the same thing with almost you can like you know lyric rights versus sync rights. You can get the lyric rights to a song, so you can have it printed in something. But they actually have it involved in something like actually have the song playing. You need sync rights, so mm. everyone could use Miss Fury in some way. But if Silverline were to put out a story with unique plot beats and it was done in a certain way, then you know that story, like oh, that we've already published that. That's those things are our idea. That's our intellectual property. The character's fine, but that plot beat is ours. <laughs> Okay, that makes mm. sense. Like Sherlock Holmes or something like that. Right. Okay. So, yeah, so that's why you had uh, Robert Downey Jr. and Benedict Cumberbatch as Sherlock Holmes at the same time, different companies. But when they had the same stories, they had to do them in different ways. Because sure. uh, if they're doing the same exact way, the same exact way, the uh, uh, same exact, you know, setting, same exact plot beats, then that would turn into a whole thing where they could start litigating that they're the one ripped off their writing. Because the writing is, is uniquely distinct from the character. That makes perfect sense. Like I, I worked on the Lord of the Rings video game, and mm -hmm. at the same time, we were doing it for Universal, and they had the rights to the video games based on the books. And right. then EA had the ones based to, on the movies. Yes. We were working in tandem, and so we had to make sure everything didn't look like the movies. Mm -hmm. yep. And the funniest thing of all is, is we were working with a, a Greg Luzniak. I don't know if, if, Roland, if you remember Greg Luzniak. Greg mm -hmm. Luzniak was on the team that I was working with. And he was one of the concept artists. And the funniest thing is, so we were doing everything not to look like EA. EA saw everybody's concept art, and then EA started hiring everybody mm -hmm. over to their game. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. So and that's yeah. funny. Yeah. And that's so, also, so, oh, go ahead. You know, I was just going to say, when I did Wizard of Oz, um, mm -hmm. the thing that we had to be careful of for the Wizard of Oz uh, adaptation was that, so the Wizard of Oz novel is in public domain. Mm -hmm. The movie, the MGM movie, is not. So so for the comic adaptation, as long as it was in the novel, we were good. We could do anything that was in the novel, whether the movie did it or not. Mm -hmm. What we couldn't do was we couldn't do like the Ruby Slippers, for instance. That's not a novel thing. That's mm -hmm. a movie thing. Those slippers were silver or diamond. I think they were silver. Uh, the, the slippers were, were silver in the novel and in the novel, which is, a, it's, it's actually a really good novel if you've never read it when, um, and I will confess that I never read it until I got the assignment, yeah. but the, the, uh, the, the good witch, when Dorothy lands, a good witch kisses Dorothy on the head 
And so Dorothy literally has this lip smack imprint on the, her, for, her forehead as she walks around. People go, oh, you've got the mark of the good witch, right? Mm. Right. Yeah. That. So I, I guess that MGM decided we don't really want <laughs> Judy Garland walking around with the big lip imprint on her head. So let's just give her ruby slippers. There you go. So, so we couldn't do we couldn't do the ruby slippers. That that lip mark thing, I wonder if that tied into the the Fight Club um, novel by uh, Chuck Palachnik because that was the whole thing. Is the guy had mm. a kiss mark on his hand from the the leader? I wonder if there was some connection there. Yeah, could, because, yeah well, the it was supposed to be uh, I believe it was called the, the Gen Xer uh, Cinderella story, where it's you know breaking out of the illusion. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh. Royal airships. I, 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 I guys, I'm getting here late because I yeah. saw the message. I saw I saw Tim's message. Am I solo tonight? And I'm like, oh no. <laughs> yeah. I've been wrapped up in class, and I was like, ah. Royal airships. God bless. There's 50 million questions here for yeah. you. Oh <laughs> yes. Yeah, but uh, yeah, we've, we've been talking with them, uh, uh, talking about like, Cthulhu <laughs> being public domain. So you know, if, oh. if Silverline wanted to, we could absolutely mm -hmm. do uh, Cthulhu story. We couldn't do the same, you know, Innsmouth arc. Um, oh my gosh! So we we would just join the fifty billion other oh, Cthulhu sure. things. Yes, <laughs> it'd be our unique take on it. You know, uh, we might have a, we might have a kickboxing Cthulhu. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, as, I guess, as I was saying, you know, and uh, talking about uh, adding impact to personality in terms of your marketing. Using something that is in public domain, it gives you that immediate bit of familiarity, and then your change to it is, adds impact to your marketing already. So, yeah. Winnie the Pooh horror movie already there is a lot of like immediate impact because we were like, "That's not my childhood, but I'm interested." Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, she could really yes. Six uh, gorilla. <laughs> I'd actually be uh, so uh, something that I've actually had uh, floating around. I think I mentioned it a few times, but I've had an idea for. A uh, character that might potentially tie into a shadow ghost of Curtis and I were to talk about this role be uh, the Nuck Moy, who is a uh, a Western Thai kickboxer. Mm. But uh, we seem to have <laughs> shadow ghost and the Nuck Moy fight a Cthulhu. Uh, <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Boom. Silver line team up number two. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, um. But uh, we're kind of getting to the the forty five minute, minute mark here. We could probably switch over to talk about uh, you know, the broader content marketing. Since not only does that part of what our our live series also encompasses, like beyond being personality marketing, and personality is probably the easiest to get into, was since it's just marketing driven by the personalities behind it. That, that's the short and simple of it. But uh, when you get into content marketing, there's a bit more you can do with it. Uh, whether that's inbound marketing, which is what I'm starting to do with the blog series now, and, and as well as some of our other YouTube videos, um, but as well as, uh, you know, uh, substantive content, uh, content, 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 and um, auxiliary content, or um, where you have stuff that's designed for people who are already in the uh, mm. ecosphere of Silverline or people who are just trying to give it, get into it. Uh, I wish Zorro's copyright could up in the U.S. God, uh, man, me yeah. too. I love Zorro. Yeah. yeah. Uh, move to Spain. Publish it there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there you go. Um, <laughs> uh, or actually, if you uh, thanks to the joys of the internet, you could possibly email a publisher in Europe. Um, uh, and then just have it imported back to your home. Um, Spanish edition. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But uh, content marketing, uh, in, in terms of you know, marketing terminology, is uh, marketing that is entirely based around additional content. With you know, it's the name is in the definition, thanks to the joys of English being the way that it is. Um, but whereas you have your main content for us, Silverline Comics, that is Silver Lions Comics. Um, uh, but their additional content might be to our video series and podcasts or uh, blog posts designed to educate and inform. And by creating uh, additional content or auxiliary content, uh, hopefully that gets someone's foot in the door to be in uh, the Silverline ecosphere. Um, 
Uh, I just recently did this uh, kind of borrowing from what I do at my, my new day job, uh, doing some uh, inbound marketing content. And what inbound essentially just means is that it's designed in a way that if someone were to type something into Google, our name would pop up in there. And they click it, they get an answer they're looking for, and they're inclined to poke around on the page more. Um, and so usually that is uh, by answering a question. It, isn't that SEO? That's a little bit of SEO. So SEO okay. and inbound, uh, inbound marketing is the concept SEO as a strategy. Okay, okay, yeah. okay, I got gotcha, you, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Okay, cool. So by having good SEO, you can elevate where your inbound marketing falls on the sheet there, but uh, you can have inbound marketing to bad SEO too. Um, and the idea is that, you know, uh, people, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, so you have to have a brand secure legal presence. Yes, no, in between de depends. Um, uh, as far as hurt. yeah, as far <laughs> as the U.S. legal system goes, it can actually vary state by state. Um, you know, as far as filing as a sole prop LLC or corporation, and then what privileges that titling has as far as your property. Um, in the state of Oregon, for instance. Um, I exist as a business and a person as Tim TK writer, but I use my full name as the business. So uh, that is, you know, the whole thing. Uh, and so because of that, anything that's related to Tim TK, I can say, Hey, that's me. You're not me. Stop. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I don't have liability protection like I would if as an LLC or a corporation. So if someone to do something highly legal as Tim TK writer, um, I'd have to clear that up first before I could tell them to stop. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, one benefit, if you were to actually, so you, you say you're not an LLC. Right. So, so one benefit, and Curtis, you may remember this. We worked with uh, a handful of, of writers in the 90s mm -hmm. who, who were LLCs. Now, the advantage of that is um, you, when you get paid as a writer, mm -hmm. they pay the LLC. The yeah. LLC then pays you, yes. right? The LLC can also buy equipment like mm -hmm. computers and scanners and cameras and phones and things like that. Yep. And that becomes a business expense and that it's you can write off that yep. you can write off as, as, as part of your LLC that is not yes. your personal thing. So yeah. um, I didn't realize that it, any of this could happen until uh, Chris, I don't know. Do you remember that at all? You remember Jerry Jones doing that? I didn't know that he 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 did that, but but um, but I I, yep. I have an LLC now, and it's it's yeah. fascinating. It's like this whole other world, and it, yeah, really it really is. Yeah, and I'm tipping all over the place, but I'm figuring things out at the same time. Yeah, yeah. that's also one of the things where it can get state by state. Like federally, that's uh, definitely applies to like overall federal taxes as well. But Oregon has some weird provisions for small businesses because Oregon really likes to have single person businesses. That's cool. So because I exist as a 1099, I I as the person inherit my expenses. So uh, if I say, like, oh, I bought new lights, I bought a new hard drive, I did this thing, saying, like, I as a person inherited that net loss on my operation. Uh, and so uh, that can apply against my my other credits and all that. Hmm. That's kind of cool. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. If, also, when you're looking at, you know, establishing a brand and legal, or a legal pres establishing legal presence, um, talk to a tax attorney. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But as far as, you know, uh, growing a brand um, into, uh, as far as intellectual property goes, you just need to have something that's put out into a marketplace to get started. Um, uh, and also the idea of, you know, don't, don't tell anyone your ideas because they're going to rip it off. The more people you tell, the more protection you have. Right. Uh, because yeah. uh, it's, as far as intellectual property goes, it's a witness-based system because yeah. it's really hard to have hard evidence. But if you can get three character references and three, you know, visual witnesses who said, like, I shared this idea. This was mentioned by this other person. Uh, then you're already yeah, ahead as far as, you know, a court system would be concerned. Yeah. And I think the same thing kind of applies to kind of maybe what Royal Airships is asking about the brand is that, mm -hmm. that uh, growing the brand, the more people are aware that Silverline exists, mm -hmm. then it's kind of like, yeah, if we ever needed to make any claims, it's like, yeah, yeah, we know Silverline. They've been around for a couple of years or we've seen them do this yep. or 
or we, you know, we watch their streams or we back their Kickstarters. And, and yeah. so, yeah, the more visible you are, the better off you're going to be in any kind of um, situation like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's kind of like the, how many times that uh, like over the past five years, have you heard stories about small artists who've been ripped off on like um, uh, online because someone has just right click saved their design and put it on a t-shirt and sold it somewhere overseas. Oh yeah. 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 So, most of the time, not even overseas. I'm in the t-shirt business. And it's like, <laughs> I got a design one time, not long back that, uh, Hey, wait, they want this just like this. And it was my artwork uh, that really? I had done like five years earlier. And uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was funny, but it was my artwork, but it was redrawn by somebody else, and it, it was funny. It, that's ha- that happens about every five years. Yeah, that's one of the things. Where it's like, yeah, great, I can do that. Here's my royalty uh, invoice. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I don't have to redraw this because I have it on file. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here's the invoice for the print job, for the design, for uh, annoying me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, like recently, I had to send up my first get my first cease and desist sent out. Wow, and and, and um, it was somebody took one of my thumbnails from one of my martial arts videos for my specific style of kung fu. Huh. And it was, I won't say who it is, but it was the leading, the oldest publication of martial arts magazines in the USD. They, they literally took my thumbnail, didn't even take off the HD little button on it, <laughs> used it for an article about my style of kung fu, didn't mention me in at all. And at the end of the article, they go, "Here are some sites that we recommend about this style," and they didn't put mine on there. Oh and man, they had been using it for like over a year and six months, a year and a half. Wow, so great. you got to send out a cease and desist to them, and you know, get that's that super fun. Oh, yeah. yeah, but it was satisfying. It was like it was nice to actually know what to do, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, to, to kind of bring it back around, so, um, getting that visibility, uh, one of the, one of the ways that's uh, definitely, uh, more recommended now that we're in the online shopper era is through creating auxiliary or additional content. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, that's because, you know, after 2008 and everything where uh, before then, a lot of people had a lot of trust in sales reps. Not so anymore. Uh, now people again, again, 60 to 70% of a buying decision is made before somebody even talks to someone from the company they're buying from. Uh, consumers going to be doing all their own research. Going to be trying to do yep. as much googling and, and talking to friends as possible before even talking to someone from that business, because they know that business is going to be you know biased towards themselves, or and it may not in some way include full disclosure. Um, and so, one way to kind of help build that trust early on is to do uh, auxiliary content or inbound uh, marketing content. The idea is that when someone is doing that research, uh, you show up. And like Curtis saying, you know, you want to be uh, a genuine and trustworthy source. So by having a uh, open and honest bit of information in an article, you know, it doesn't need to be like a full disclaimer or like full like breakdown of a subject because, you know, people honestly don't want that. They want to have a quick answer and maybe some context. So by giving them a quick answer and some context, as well as giving them places to get additional research, you already start building that trust. So even if you weren't their first thought, you're already more trustworthy than the site that's saying like 10 reasons why we're the best and our competitors suck. And <laughs> they're like, well, that's a, a little on the nose. <laughs> um, I like, I like the shady ones that are like, Oh, chocolate's good for you. And there's antioxidants. And you're like, who did this study? And it's like, Oh, yeah. the Hershey's corporation. Hershey's oh, yeah. Did, yeah. Hershey's did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's like, uh, it's like Marlboro did the re- uh, research that says uh, one cigarette a day is good for you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah. So says Marlboro. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, Coca Cola tells you that uh, yes, it's great for your uh, uh, co- one Coke a day is great yeah. for your uh, digest- digestive tract. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and so uh, working working with an HVAC company, like uh, obviously you want to tell people like you should buy your HVAC from us. But right. the, the key thing, like, is being open also that. Um, a lot of HR companies will make a lot of money by giving you duct cleanings. Spoiler, mm. you probably don't need it. And uh, so, in our article, <laughs> we're like, like, reasons you need our, uh, a duct cleaning, you don't, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, and it's so like, but you offer that as a service, like, well, yes, the reason being is uh, we can actually use that to diagnose other issues, find like a rat infestation, find mold, find damage. But 20 to 25 percent of houses, we don't do any service, we don't charge them. 
uh, will do it if you're if you like you feel like your allergies are acting up or if you feel like you hear something in your floorboards. Absolutely, we'll come out and take a look at it. But if it's not a thing you don't need, it's not a thing you, you don't need. Um, mm. So in our article on Silverline that I posted today, um, mentioning about like, you know, and we'll, we'll be follow up, but I, I ended there with a little bit of context on growing your craft as a comic because I want to, we have a series called The Craft of Comics, but I realized we never actually like told people what The Craft of Comics is. <laughs> 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 so I wanted to answer that question. Um and at the end, I, I mentioned, you know, well, how are, how are some ways you can grow your craft? I, I don't say read the rest of our website. I mentioned you can. But the first thing I say is you, you do it. That's how you get better at something. You do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, I, I've always thought it's funny, Tim. You probably heard me say this in class. Um, I've always thought it funny how, how so many things, skills, uh, things like that people know you've got to spend you ask someone how do you hey how do you get better at playing a piano piano anyone will tell you you spend hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of practice and yet i can't tell you tim you you probably went to school with some of them how many writers come through my program to come through the full cell program not my program but my class the full cell program and think that oh i know how to type i'm a writer (laughs) <laughs> that's yeah. not the way it works yeah yeah <laughs> you, no. why 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 is it that writers think and, and and some creative people think that all they got to do is know how to do it they don't need to spend the hours of practice and practice and practice and practice like anyone else does mm-hmm. with their craft they just think oh i just got to know how to do it well yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> or, or if they do, they look for the, the shortcut. Look for the yeah. guy that tells them, like, "Oh, in these ten steps, we'll improve it by whatever." Here's your uh, magic bean. Yeah. Yes, yeah, and so that's I, uh, you know, being open to honest our content. Uh, you know, I don't say like, "Oh, you can follow our five blog posts on like <laughs> interviews with writers to increase your writing capabilities." Like, no, maybe we should you, do that though. Maybe you should. Do that. <laughs> uh, but no, uh, tell me like you you do the things. Um, <laughs> You you did one about uh, you guys on on Tuesday did one about uh, clickbait once before maybe yeah. we should do that yeah, yeah. <laughs> to be a better writer click here yeah it's a ten <laughs> steps to improve your writing right <laughs> write more yeah <laughs> have you ever seen those that say uh, uh, the ten steps to being a better writer and you click on it and there's seven there oh yeah <laughs> you're you like last two where's the other three <laughs> yes <laughs> absolutely yeah. Um, uh, and so that's kind of like the basis of inbound marketing is by answering questions and you can do that by, you know, uh, doing an educational service like that. And the other one is, you know, uh, general curiosity. And so one I have planned is, you know, obviously our name Silver Lion takes inspiration from the Silver Age of Comics. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I wonder how many readers of comics now who have gotten into it, you know, in their high school or college ages are completely unfamiliar with the Silver Age of Comics. So. It might do something like, oh, what is the Silver Age of Comics? Or where does Silverline come from? So mm-hmm. if someone does Google, like, or someone hears about the Silver Age of Comics, and they are interested, like, oh, what is that even? Uh, yeah. 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 You immediately have that uh, answer for them. It's like, oh, that's cool. Uh, and then, you know, if you, again, you don't really try to sell them something, but you provide context. So if they're interested in seeing what a Silver Age inspired comic might look like, they know they can buy from you. So they're making a decision to buy. They're not being sold. It. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny because, you know, when 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 uh, I first started buying comics, there was really only the Golden Age and Silver Age. Mm-hmm. People didn't talk a whole lot about the Silver Age because we were really close to it, right? Yeah, yeah. So it was just like it was the Golden Age and then and the Silver Age. Well, now there's this whole, I mean, there's, the, you know, there's multiple ages now as to where yeah. we are. There's the Bronze Age. There's the, you know, the, the people talk about the uh, the... The image age, I think it's also called the iron age, you know, depends yeah. on who you listen to. Um, you know, so it's just it's it's kind of it's kind of weird to see as we move forward how you know how we keep adding yeah. different ages. Yeah, and we're doing like and I, I guess kind of you know perhaps for the best, we uh, the ages aren't really assigned based on like the perceived value or like Mm-mm. worth of the comics. It's just the chronological order that came in. Yeah, right. so, so it feels like we're almost got like in reverse of like wedding anniversaries. <laughs> so like next <laughs> time we'll have like the wood age. Or... <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Dirt. Dirt. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, one, one of the, the shadiest marketing that I've ever seen recently mm. If you've ever heard of this 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 uh, touring show called Shen Yun, I don't know if you ever heard. Oh, of it. yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, so so I had known of this. There's a political group in China called the Fat Long Gong, and they're um, they were diametrically opposed. Don't say their name, Curtis. <laughs> yeah, they're diametrically <laughs> opposed to the to the Chinese government. They're into like far out stuff, like a lot of energy work, meditation, alien. So I believe some alien worship. Yes. And they freaked out the government there because they all showed up in front of one of the government buildings with like thousands of them in one morning just standing there meditating creep the government out back in the 90s <laughs> ever since then they've been kind of out, they've been uh, hunted down and persecuted wow and, and so for years they were trying to make inroads in the u.s and get funding and get support and what they hit upon was this idea of having this thing called shen yun which is supposed to be this beautiful show of what china was like pre-communist and it's supposed to be the real authentic dance and music and all these things but really it's a way to get people in and they've kind of rewritten history mm -hmm. to their agenda and you'll know because if because i found out because we took my mother-in-law to it who's from china and as soon as it started i'm like where's their ufo symbolism in the corners <laughs> of the stage nah. and, and then they started talking about this group the falun gong well most people didn't know who they were so they just thought this is chinese history i said oh my gosh we're in a cult propaganda show <laughs> Oh, yeah. And we paid top dollar to get propaganda. So, so yeah, we watched the propaganda show. And then when we left, they had our address and they've been sending us like these crazy <laughs> propaganda newspapers every freaking month. Mm -hmm. So, wow. but, you know, that, that show. Well, that's, that's, <laughs> a, that's a scary thing, though, because as you just pointed out, mm -hmm. you were there and all the people were like, oh, this must be Chinese history. And yeah. you're like, what the heck is going on here? Yeah. I, I think that's a that's a. a uh, and you guys probably see it on the things that you know. It's like when you see somebody talking about something, you're like, and you know, like, okay, that's not the truth. But then you see people around you believe in it. You're like, wait, what are you doing? Stop. That's not true, right? Yeah. <laughs> Just because it, it, and it, and it goes back to the old, those who, you know, yeah. forget history are deemed to, are doomed to repeat it. There's, yeah. a, there's, a, there's a whole thing that ran on TikTok for a while about someone who's talking about how Rome didn't exist. And it started <laughs> like a whole movement. I'm like, Oh my oh, gosh. All right. No. It's the, the, like we're, it's the most documented like ancient, ancient civilization we have um, <laughs> outside of uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, I forgot the, uh, Matsu Musa, his kingdom, because, because he bought a bunch of newspapers. Um, but uh, the, uh, like, like, and yet we're, we're, we're like 90% certain that the completely undocumented, uh, see people exist as well because there's enough evidence there. It's like there's a there's a great depth between like something we already know exists and something that like has just so much documentation that you're saying doesn't exist. It's like I don't. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes, you know, it's, it's it's one of these things too. You know, so so I had two I had two two of my grandfathers fought in World War II, right? Mm -hmm. And as well as some great uncles and things like that. And when I see people talk about the Holocaust didn't exist, oh yeah, I'm like, how can you even listen? This is so fresh. This is not. This is not like even, you know, it's not even a hundred years old yet, right? Yeah. This is just like what seventy. I can't do math, but like seventy yeah. years ago, it's like, yeah, I, you know, I, how can we've got video footage? We've got, you know, yeah, you picture can... footage. We've got evidence, and they're saying it didn't exist. Like what it, you can you can take a tour of the camps and in weird cases you can still find teeth under rubble. <laughs> my my, my yeah. uh, one of my grandfathers was an infantryman in in you know uh, uh, France and in southern Germany and he was one of the first uh, he was one of the first units there at uh, Auschwitz mm -hmm. and he told stories of actually seeing the bodies piled up. Yeah, you know, and and you know, I, I believe my grandfather. My grandfather's not gonna lie to yeah, me about yeah. that. Why? Why would he lie to me about that? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, he yeah. was a farmer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So it's just it's weird to think that there are people out there who 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 want to say that, and you, and you got to ask yourself, what's the purpose? Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it's like uh, the the bigger the lie, right? And it's it's yeah. like and 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 like. Of course, from my, my Kung Fu background, the one that'll trip you, you out probably is whenever people say Kung Fu, they think of the Shaolin Temple and that the Shaolin yeah. Temple's where it's. Oh, yeah, yeah. The funny thing is, is that the Shaolin Temple doesn't really, for the most part, do real Kung Fu anymore. And so what, what ended up happening is during the culture of revolution, they didn't want people learning martial arts because martial arts was tied to secret societies and political appeal. So they created a new martial art called Wushu under the banner yeah. that 
comrade shall not hurt comrade. Where basically it's a performance art. Yeah. So now you have generations of people, I mean, in China that don't know what actual Kung Fu is because it's only in Hong Kong, the US, yeah. Taiwan, places like that, yeah. including the Shaolin Temple. So wow. the funny thing is if you have somebody who does another art like MMA or kickboxing and they'll look at that and they'll go, well, that doesn't look like you can do it for fighting. And the real Kung Fu people will agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, it, yeah. It just like the birthplace of Kung Fu is the fake Kung Fu. Yeah, that's uh, there's a, a good YouTube channel called uh, Ransom. Uh, he's, he's not posting any content, but he's a guy who, for uh, a while, he he lived in Germany. Uh, he was born in China. He moved back to China and just trying to figure out what to do. He went to the Shaolin Temple and trained there. And he was like, "Oh, it's a performance art school." <laughs> it's like, it's like we have internet access full time. Like some people meditate, but most of the time you don't. And it's about you know. You, you do a lot of training and they will beat the crap out of you with the wooden <laughs> sticks if you mess up, but because they're there mostly to be tourists. <laughs> oh, I, I saw, I saw a, a travelogue show go there. And so yeah. the thing that they separate is they have what's called Sanda, which is basically kickboxing with throws. Yeah. And they have Wushu, which looks like real Kung Fu, but is a performance art. And I saw a documentary where they went over there and they said, this is ancient times. The Shaolin monks did Wushu for exercise. So they did all these flips and all these movements. And they said, but they did Sanda for practical fighting. So what they imagine visualizing a monk on top of the mountain doing all these beautiful movements. And then he walks down the hill and is accosted by this gang. And he starts actually like kickboxing. and, and <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> but his, History got rewritten, you know? Yeah. It just <laughs> yep. uh, yeah. uh, and, and, you know, uh, a lot of it comes down to like uh, marketing is not a new philosophy or even a new skill. It's been around forever. Um, uh, there's actually a really good book, uh, speaking of, of history, uh, called uh, The Bronze Lie. And essentially what it does, it breaks down the centuries of Spartan advertising that they used to say that it, we're better than the Athenians. <laughs> and they're like, we're the better warriors. And the Athenians are like, we, we beat you in like every war. What are you talking about? <laughs> 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 and so, and, and, and that ties into the book called Legion versus Phalanx, which uh, talks about like, well, the, it's like, well, why did the, if the Spartans were like these great warriors, and, like the ancient Greeks had this all together, why did they eventually like fall to the Romans? And like, because logistics win wars, it doesn't matter like how tough you say you are, like if you don't have supply lines. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, that's, that's kind of breaking down is like, so you can say you're as tough as you are and you can do as much as you as you want, but uh, your image what, only goes you so far. <laughs> yeah, when you run out of food and bullets, that's <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. the end right there. Yep. <laughs> what would be everybody's hot take on the idea of what we see now that there's social media engagement between oh companies, companies and more so companies, creators, mm -hmm. the fandom? Um, yeah. Is that actually a strategy, or is that just everybody going buck wild like crazy? It's I, it, it's it's a it's uh it is yeah. So that kind of falls into uh, it's kind of our personality driven marketing, where uh you know that happened with Tesla and Musk, where they realized that oh, if I just exist as this absurd person online, and I think he also <laughs> a little uh, another here, another there, but um uh do can drive a lot of hype behind your product or behind what you're doing just by being absurd. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so you'll have seen things like that. Um, Kardashians. Mm -hmm. Oh man. Yeah. Oh, the downfall of Western civilization. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Here, you know, here's, here's a question for you too, along those same lines in, 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 so, you know, let's, I, I'm, I'm really going to skirt the political thing here and try not to be that way because I'm not trying to go there. Right. But when you look at, at just say, say Trump, right, when Trump was in office and all of the uh, fake news and the media and, and now where we are, we're split. Right. Mm -hmm. As far as, uh, you know, what does this news organization do? What does this news organization do? It, it, let's just 100 years from now. How are they going to figure out what's true and what's not? Mm -hmm. you, you know what I mean? What's real or, or what, yeah. when they looking back, what are they going to, how are they going to figure out, well, this is a real thing and this was just hype or this was just, yeah. you know, fake what, news one, or one person, yeah, one person's strongly the worded statement. Um, but yeah, everything is so strongly tied into uh, personality now that unless you, uh, 
uh, start to uh, peel that back and uh, create uh, have CEOs that essentially are un- un- not allowed to touch social media. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, the idea is that you know uh, bring, uh, bring the focus back on the corporation. The corporation can have a personality, but it's a, a highly digested and broken down uh, personality. But um, everything's so tied in now to uh, personality-driven engagement uh, that seeing when you look at something, you're probably also going to get uh, a bunch of uh, information pulled in around the, the names associated with it. And that's almost as influential as the actual content or value of the actual name. So we have to look, really look at everything now going forward, being influenced by the names associated as much as the actual product or merit of that product or service. Yeah. Uh, and uh, unless we do go back to the point where uh, there is a, a stronger disconnect between people, <laughs> like uh, almost to a point where it had pre-social media times, I, I don't yeah. know how that would change, but maybe that's for social engineers and civic planners. <laughs> well, that, that's a good point because yeah. you think about the big personalities in commerce and industry, and they usually behind the scenes now we know were actually in arguments with their handlers or the people mm-hmm. like, like I saw a documentary on John DeLorean. I mean, he was, mm. I mean, like when he was at General Motors or whatever, they were just like butting heads like oh, yeah. left and right, but he was the star guy, but he also was pushing himself uh, yeah. to the feet, you know? And um, as, as it has history is weird, right? Because at some mm-hmm. point you just got to believe who you're going to believe. It's like um, yeah. being, you know, you know, having some Japanese ancestry and you know about Japanese Americans mm-hmm. during World War II. And yeah. um, there's a really great documentary called, I think it's called The Slanted Screen, where they talk about the depictions of Asian Americans pre-World War II and after. And I didn't realize that je- there was a Japanese heartthrob in American silent film. Yeah. Like one of the top heartthrob draws at the time. But as soon as the um, propaganda machine had to go into mm-hmm. the war, that was just rewritten. You know? yeah, so wow. it's, yeah, but nowadays with, with, with the media and online, I don't know who to believe. You, you almost... Every, I don't trust mm-hmm. anybody, and I trust everybody just as, as little. Right. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> everything's going to be like, it's weird how much like, it'll even impact like the personalities. You also have like, an inverse where the world itself will impact personalities to, to like who they are as a person. When you look at the start of World War I, uh, the Kaiser of Germany, the King of England, and the Tsar of Russia were cousins. Yeah. They all, they all grew up in Windsor Palace. That's so weird. I know. Yeah. Uh, uh, but at the start, uh, at the start of tensions, the King of England is forced to change his last name because it was too German. <laughs> so he took the name Windsor because that's where they live. Yeah. Uh, that's the whole reason why they had the last name. But before then, I can't remember the name of it, but they, they had a very German last name up until World War One. But you end up seeing the same where like how much that will like force a person to almost change who they are too. Mm-hmm. Uh, our, our our relation to uh, media, some media now definitely, but to exposure and optics is so impactful that it will cause a person to essentially change their personality and change their family history. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, you know, I, I, for, for some years, and this may be getting deeper than you want to go for, <laughs> for some years, I've actually believed, you know, for, for a while uh, we saw the world, with empire, right? Mm-hmm. The, the empires were grow, growing. Uh, nations were, were, were getting big nations gobbling up the small nations. And um, I believe, you know, and this is not through long hours of study at all, just, just, you know, kind of observation. I believe we're actually on the opposite side of that. Now I mm-hmm. believe we're, we're actually, uh, and maybe it is due to the fact that we have social media all over the place now and, and we can get instant, you know, instant uh, communication. But I, I think that, you know, even what we're kind of seeing in in, in Russia, uh, probably even with the start of the, the fall of the Berlin Wall and the fracture of the old uh, USSR, what with, you know, Lithuania, Latvia and all those becoming countries again, I, I think we're just seeing people gravitate more towards a self rule than okay we don't want this big big monstrosity in moscow to rule us right yeah 
And uh, so I think that you're seeing kind of the fall of the empires. Yeah. Um, I don't know how, how that will affect us in the U S I don't know. Um, uh, but I, you know, you can't be living in the U S today and, and not see that there is, uh, certainly divided, mm. in, you know, sensibilities in the U S. So I don't know yeah. what that means for us, but you know, I, I think the world is headed in that direction. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. I mean, <laughs> We we can watch the uh, the Silver Line Geopolitics podcast. Right? <laughs> we should, we should. Yeah, we should. yeah. But uh, I, you know, again, if I'm the same with you, where maybe the U.S. might be a little too big for its purchase, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so you were like, there is no, yeah. Um, well, uh, I think yeah. I think sometimes we forget uh, as, as Americans, we forget just how big this country mm-hmm. is. Yeah. You know, Tim, Tim, you and I are about as far away from each other as you could get in, in the geographic, the, the 48 contiguous states. Yes. Right. Uh, and, and that's what probably 3000 miles, more than 3000 miles. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, you could put all of Europe yeah. inside, a, you know. That's, so so it's funny when Europeans say, oh, yeah, yeah we, we drove over. We went to, to yeah, Germany yeah. for the weekend. Yeah. Well, that's like me saying I went up to Tennessee for the weekend, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. It's like, yeah, I, I know people who, uh, like, I've come through, like, um, uh, Alsace Lorraine, which, you know, was Germany, was France, right. is now France, sometimes Germany. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, the Franco Prussian War was a trip. Um, but uh, they were talking about, like, yeah, when they're skiing, uh, if they go on like a skiing trip in the winter, they'll ski through Germany to Switzerland to France <laughs> and then spend the night in Italy. <laughs> wow. um, that's just one ski, and that's just, like, that, and that's just like, them skiing down the same uh, mountain trail. Yeah, um, yeah, it's it, it's definitely yeah. interesting. And we we do that with states, right? I yes. don't know yeah. state, but yeah, yeah, you know, there's the there's the four corners that that uh, was it New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, and somebody uh you, you know the, the the four the four corner yeah. where the state all four states meet and you can yeah. put your you know you can stand in all four states yeah, yeah. i guess yeah. if you had four legs but <laughs> yeah honestly well, yeah uh the if you're uh, aaron and i uh you, share um uh the columbia river so if you're in portland or vancouver it's uh you know you'll do your shot day shopping down in portland because you don't pay sales tax up there and then you'll go up and uh spend the night in vancouver because you have a cheaper rent up there <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah. Uh, content marketing. Yeah, yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. <Yes. laughs> right. Yeah. Back. Sorry, that's probably my fault. <laughs> no, oh, no, it's, it's fine. It's yeah, it's great. Yeah. I mean, I don't have any of my history books down here, but that's actually no. I do. Uh, actually, one of the ones I was talking about. Uh, but Legion versus Phalanx, talking about uh, how uh, Rome was able to supplant Greece as being the dominant power. Um, but uh, uh, so content marketing. So we kind of talk about how you have that initial footstep in style answering questions type marketing, which uh, the book they ask you answer talked about. Uh, what I've been uh currently studying for my day job. Uh, and that creates your auxiliary content, which isn't your main content. It uh, that your com- for us are comics, uh, mm-hmm. our, our, our actual you know monetary item uh and then you have substantive content and this is something for people that already exist in your ecosystem uh for us it's almost more of our, our live shows a lot of people who come to our live shows are already in our ecosystem they're here to learn more about us as personalities they get our personality driven marketing here to stay inside the ecosystem this is our retention program um <laughs> uh uh, and so, like, they already uh, they already trust Silverline, and they just want to get to know us a bit more. Or if you pre-order the you know our Kickstarters, you might get additional add-ons, additional content that's not the main monetary item. Uh, right now, I'm working on still writing the history edition for Wolf Hunter, which is uh, turned out to be much longer than I wanted to actually plan on. Because I was going to be like, oh, just do like you know uh, uh, a paragraph or so per page in the comic. I'm like, all right, here's three pages explaining the blitz. <laughs> Now let's talk about the Hawker Hurricane and the Measure Schmidt. <laughs> uh, so if you pre-ordered the, and got the that here, you will get a cited and sourced uh, their uh, tertiary historical reference for the Blitz, the Channel War, and the Desert Mission. <laughs> I'm sorry, you're welcome. 
<laughs> oh my gosh, that's like a great start, uh, title for our podcast. I'm sorry, you're welcome. Yes. Sorry, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah. so, yeah. to my, I, I love the first issue and the opening. The opening was just so solid, you know. Yeah, it was I know so that, fun. I know that's a big thing that that Roland was kind of impressing upon me is like, hit that ground running and get them into the story and like yes. you you nailed it. I love that. I love that. I love that story. Yeah. Thank really. you. Yeah. Uh, I'm definitely hoping that, you know, people who stayed for the uh, planes uh, mm -hmm. will stay for the spies and trains in the second issue and then stick around for the cars and automobiles in the third issue. If you get what I did there, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> trains, trains, and automobiles. You go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Well, I, I will say this. Um, I took. Um, I was in Pittsburgh this this last yeah, weekend. How was it? How was it? Yeah, it, it was good. It was good. It was. Um, it's about the size of Daytona, probably. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I, I think I was I, as anticipating it to be a little bit bigger than than what it was because I'm thinking you know I'm a Southern boy, uh, Pittsburgh, big city, San Diego Comic Con. It was not that, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but it was good. They were um they were a, a, a lot of people very interested in independent comics, which I absolutely <laughs> love. People mm -hmm. were coming by, and and, and I, I will say this. Um, th this this makes me a further believer in the putting text on comics because uh, I had them all out on the table, right? And uh, Wolf Hunter with its text on the yeah. cover was up front. Right, so obviously I wasn't flying, so I couldn't take, you know, thousands of copies of everything. I tried to take like, uh, you know, five copies of, of... dudes. y'all know how many books we have now? It's a bit. It's <laughs> a fair got, bit. Books, right? Yeah. So I, I think I found like 31 books, right? Wow. Right. And so so obviously I can't take, you know, uh, multiple copies of everything. Yep. There you go. And um, I will say this, unless Scott had one, Wolf Hunter number one, I took five copies of Wolf Hunter number one sold out. Nice. nice. Because nice. people would uh, people would look at it and I would see them say, "Ooh, Spy Hunter. Cool. Yeah. I think, you know, they're they're seeing that they're reading mm -hmm. the text on that cover. Right. And that's what that's that that extra hook. Yeah. that's getting them to pick it up and so and it's definitely like a bit of like uh inbound inbound marketing on that um kind of getting that uh I, I think i said this before but personally i'm not the uh biggest fan of texting over myself because i like some big <laughs> clean art I, right? I like giant portraits giant portraits but i get it uh yeah. because it's the same thing where people don't want to be sold something they want to buy something so if they want right. to buy it i know exactly what that is i've done all my research in five seconds here's your money <laughs> Well, and, and that's it. And, and I, you know what? As, as a as a comic book geeky fan, I totally mm -hmm. get that. I, I, yeah. you know, I love art. I love looking at art. I love the pictures, right? Yeah. But when you're trying to buy something, it just that little the I, I can't even remember the text uh, it, 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 Tim came up with. You know, Captain Willard. Uh, uh, what, what do you have? The other uh, one, yeah, uh, yeah. Tim. I, I have all three of them over here. Yeah. Uh, uh, also, the art by Quinn and the art by uh, uh, you know, Peter uh, and uh, uh, the also the reference art the uh, the uh, this art here uh, I'm blanking on the last name uh, but um, yeah, right. yes yeah that one yeah. Uh, group captain James Lord Englishman fighter ace spy hunter boom uh, yeah I mean uh, that's everything you need to know right there you yeah. see the cool fighter plane right. Mm -hmm. You know, you, know what, you know what it's like is is back not too long ago, movie trailers had the voiceover guy saying, oh, yeah. you know, we're all blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And that was that extra. Then all of a sudden they got a little bit more artsy where they took out it completely. Mm. And it's more the the feeling and the impression that you get, but you don't really know. Yeah. Yes. Also, I like this one because, I mean, the inside of the comic is very Euro comic and this mm -hmm. feels the most Euro comic style cover. Yeah, but uh, that one also uh, we we got a little cheeky with this one given our other uh, several line title. But the planes and trains start a game of cat and mouse, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw that and I'm like, wait, is Tim trying to say something to me? What's he trying to say? <laughs> I'm saying, uh, uh, Wolf Hunter, uh, Kalis, Cat and Mouse, same universe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, yeah, it's exactly the same thing. Where it's, it's that that it's that voiceover, so. It's a little bit of um, inbound marketing where when someone sees it, they uh, it, it gets it gets them on the inbound trajectory. So when they see that text, they know, okay, 
this is what I'm buying into, and I buy this beyond just the cover art. Mm. I do also think that we do have a very strong visual presence and visual identity for each of the covers, yeah. which definitely like also the little deals when someone sees it, they don't see like not just Spy Hunter, but like oh, this is a World War II setting or this yes. is a English setting and and all that kind of fun stuff. Right. Uh, and uh, we're going to see Quentin's setting. It's a little darker. It's a little more um, like serious. And know that people will die in the first issue, and they do. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, and it also, I, the the thing, I think Quentin's cover uh, very much communicates that sort of dude is a spy, James Bond spy. Yeah. Right? That's kind of what it communicates. Uh, uh, the, I, I think I think also, um, wouldn't you also think psychologically, there actually forces them or brings them into actually physically picking it up and mm -hmm. reading it. So they're already one step closer to reading the book. Yes. They're actually in that trajectory of yeah. They're, they're they're creating that that more inbound uh, uh, that more inbound vector where they're making the decision to to buy it and they're helping themselves along that decision the entire time. Whereas you know if you see a really cool cover, but you're, you're not maybe you're not feeling it talkative for that convention and you kind of get up awkwardly, you pick it up, you look it over in the back, you look on the first page, like kind of on it over, and then you might hand them cash. Yeah. <laughs> and so and they're like, oh, this is a spy book, and you say yes. I'm like. Great, I, I've done my research. I'm making an informed decision. Did you notice that, Roland? Was that part of the? I, yeah, I do. I think so. I think um, so. So one of the things that that um, and you, if you've done conventions, you guys may may hopefully you've maybe seen the same things, right? Mm -hmm. Is that when you're behind a table, there's so so comic book people right and that include us in that mm -hmm. right so i'm not saying oh look the fans right no uh comic book people we're not the most naturally outgoing people no. right <laughs> comic book people are filled with introverts well, obviously there are some right but but the overwhelming majority of comic book people are introverts mm -hmm. and so they're not inclined to walk by your table and have a conversation with you yeah. they're just not so you got to 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 reach out to them and I have found that, um, oh, it's Sweebanks. What's up? Uh, I have found that if you can get them to actually hold a comic, your chances increase exponentially that they will hand you money for it, mm -hmm. right? Because so many of them come by and say, you know, no, 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 thanks. Or they'll just look. They'll You'll start telling them and they'll just look. And so I'm always, hey, here, you can flip through it and look at it yourself. And and I have found that if you can get them to do that, the and I, I don't know numbers because I didn't write them down, right? But but the chances do increase exponentially that they'll walk away with it, and I don't mean steal it. Yeah, <laughs> yes, <laughs> ideally not. Yeah, right. uh, and, and you know, and, and can uh, further translating that into now being in the online era where you know we we. We love to be in physical stores, but right now, you know, online, we primarily sell through Kickstarter and Indie Planet. Uh, and sort of getting that same methodology of trying to get people in without them having to, you know, talk to us first. Because again, we're <laughs> making buying, 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 buying decisions before they talk to us. Yeah. Uh, so the idea is building that sense of trust beforehand. So by using, um, you know, our craft series and what it's turning into now, as well as what uh, a lot of our uh, YouTube shows are. It's um, you create a sense of trust because we create uh, a form of education. So when people see it, like um, they might get first introduced to Silverline primarily as a teacher on their own comics journey, or as if they're just trying to learn about the hobby of collecting comics. They're like, oh, they're talking about you know how these collections work, or how they can get started in writing, or how this uh, art techniques works, or you know, if they are already following something and, you know, we have interviews with, um, uh, we just put out last week an interview with Dean Zachary. And, you know, if they uh, read the Deep Space Nine series in the, uh, 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 was it late 90s, uh, early 2000s-ish uh, that Dean had done some art for, mm -hmm. like, well, how did he do that? Well, we now mm -hmm. have content where they can get that answer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so you end up getting a sense where when people see the name Silverline, they might think, oh, I trust them to learn how to do comics myself. 
and that might guide them in towards, oh, they're doing a Kickstarter now, true. What's that about? Right. Or, or if they already get into the cycle where like, oh, this is a really great user. So I'm going to subscribe to the weekly newsletter. We have a weekly newsletter. Um, <laughs> that's tied into the, the post that I, I put up on our website. Um, and I just, you know, if they want to get more information on, on creating comics or about comic culture or whatever. And that is what gets them in the door. So that way when we are selling something or uh, if they're on the website and they're like, oh, I want it. I'm feeling, I got some extra money. You might want to pick up some reading material. They can just click on the buy comics tab. It's right there. Or when we do put a post saying like we have a Kickstarter launch right now, they're already in the ecosphere. Yeah. They're, they're already converted. We're not, you know, trying to, to approach them coldly. They already came to us. Right. The comments are getting really lively. I think they heard you talk about Shea Yun earlier. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Funny. <laughs> uh, it's funny we're sitting here sitting here talking about this and all of us are watching the comments. Yes. Over here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, they just missed the alien talk earlier, didn't they? Yeah, uh, right, yeah. Yeah. With aliens. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, <too soon>. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it sounds like overall it was a it was a successful trip. Yeah, yeah. it was good. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was good. I I got to to, to meet. Uh, well, um, uh, I'd met her before, but she didn't. She clearly didn't remember me. Scott Scott's wife, Cassie. Mm. Um, she uh, they when Scott graduated here at Full Sail, I met them. I met uh, he and his his clan, and uh, so she was there. She she sounded very Yankee, so I like to listen to her talk. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, but you know, Scott and Rory were both there, and it was good to see those guys in action. Uh, you know, as as fate would have it. Um, the table behind us was unoccupied. And so I just asked the, 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 the con people who were very cool, by the way, I said, Hey, this person hadn't showed up. Do you care? He said, give them till this much time. And if they don't show up, it's yours. And so like 15 seconds after the time passed, we, 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 we claim the table. And so they set up a whole, uh, steam Patriots table and, and we were back to back that way. So it was, uh, it was, it was really good. It worked out. They moved. I, you know, I don't know. I haven't, uh, had a chance to, to follow up with Scott to see, but, uh, they moved quite a bit of copies, um, sitting there talking to people about steam Patriots. So it was very, very cool to see these guys in action. Very good. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, do so we, are we do we like the BBC? <laughs> um, the British Broadcasting Company, yes. Yes. Uh, is this the journal? Is it like four things posted? That's David. Hey, what's hey, up, Rios? Hey, what's We're up? on yeah, three Disney. different websites right now, uh, David. So you have the Facebook general chat. Uh, we also have YouTube and Twitch. Uh, so any one of those. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. he's wondering what what because we're, we're talking about the uh, chat. We yes. see the chat, and yeah, David's like, yeah. I don't see nothing. <laughs> So right now, David, we're watching the tw Twitch chat blow up. <laughs> yes, yeah, it, it's getting interesting. Uh, it's it's being monitored by our team of professional mods. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, yes. A tier um, three Pokemon sub. I don't Pokemon. know what that means. That's a it's a Twitch thing. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, so for for because uh, because I know Curtis knows, but for Quentin and Tim, uh, David is a former Malibu Comics colorist who, who is this close to finishing coloring Demon's Tales. Ooh, uh, yeah, the, nice. the, the Paul Pelletier, Thomas Flormonti uh, drawn comic. So, and it looks real. You guys have probably seen me post colored images just little panels here and there from D demon's tales that's uh that that was david doing that so yeah nice i'm excited yeah. about it yeah i'm looking forward to that yeah. all right uh so this actually might be kind of interesting uh we have a little bit of time left uh so roland you've obviously been uh well also uh heard you have as well uh but at least as an editor uh you've been in the game you know free internet uh yeah through internet <laughs> uh, right Go, and even like uh, going from you know Malibu, uh, Malibu is an imprint, and and so far completely independently. 
Uh -huh. uh, so in terms of, you know, marketing and what those budgets look like, uh, well, I'm budgets, but, uh, you know, uh, budgets have obviously shifted going from print to whatever to whatever. Uh, uh, the amount of money that's also spent on, on midway cabinets and the side posters is also kind of an interesting thing to look at from the nice. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, what's kind of um, been interesting to watch as far as marketing has gone from pre-online to online and the shifts and the changes and strategies they're at from at least from your perspective Ooh, um so what i remember about our marketing so obviously part of marketing is is finding your customer base mm -hmm. finding a base of potential customers is what i should say right um we used to do most of our marketing geared towards the retailers, okay? Because the retailers are ultimately who purchase the comics from the distributors. Yeah. Uh, we had a fan network, but uh, it wasn't huge. Um, at least not that I, I recall. Curtis may remember differently. I don't remember being being that big. But our marketing was, was mostly geared towards targeting the comic book retailers and of course back then you know there was a whole bunch this is pre-crash so what four thousand um uh <laughs> don't say it don't say it four, don't, don't, uh, don't so four thousand <laughs> retailers um i, I gotta got stop looking <laughs> about four thousand retailers and um you know so we so we were targeting them um, to, to get them to pick up the, the, the books. Um, you didn't really target the distributors. The distributors don't care, right? Some people will sometimes talk about, Hey, you know, you're going to market to the distributors. Well, they don't care. They'll, they'll just carry the books to whoever's going to order them. Right. Um, today, I, I think I, I've seen a shift of, um, going into, uh, going into trying to target the, consumer directly right and i think that's what we see with um with all the social media uh, we we are able to even you know these streams we go directly to the people who support us right they get to they get to come on here and interact with us they get to as you mentioned uh, sign up for our newsletter the weekly newsletters and that comes directly from us to them so um, I think that's for me, I think the biggest shift has, has I've seen is going from selling to the, the retailer to targeting the consumer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think I can. I mean, you know, all of us that it, where we're at Malibu, have such a such fun memories of it. And they really tried to do things different. I can only imagine what that Malibu team would have done with social media. Oh, my goodness. Oh. They were so creative and so clever. I actually saw someone ask one time on the on the Ultraverse page. They said, "Hey, do you guys think that if Kickstarter and crowdfunding had been around when Malibu was around, would Malibu have used it?" Tom Mason responded, "Absolutely, we would have jumped all over that." Yeah, and I think they would have they would have been very successful because yeah. that company is very uh, early adapter of a lot of technology and things. I would say I agree with Roland. I mean, I mean, it's that direct dialogue. I mean. When I was working under Roland, I would he would give me the little fan letters, like paper mm -hmm. letters from people uh, from Rob Running Water, and um, he <laughs> was, and, and he would say, "Hey, get, give this guy some swag. Send him some yeah. stickers and you know this and ash cans and all stuff." Um, but it was so limited, you know. Now yeah. there's that direct dialogue. I think what what we're seeing predominantly now is there's that saying, "Never give an idiot a microphone," right? And the <laughs> problem is, is everybody has a microphone. Yes. And there's a lot of idiots out there. Yeah. And um, and so that's it, it's actually as great as it is having that direct dialogue. I'd say there's a lot of people in a lot of different industries that's spoiling it for the entire, mm -hmm. the, the whole bunch. You know. Well, how do you? Yeah. you the, and the the challenge is like for for us, the challenge is how do we rise above the noise? Yeah. You know. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, does someone want to come here and, and listen to us talk or they, do they want to go over to a more, um, how can I say this, a more contentious site where they're calling people names, you right. know, and, and, and slinging mud. That's yeah. something, you know, that, I mean, that's, that's like watching a train wreck. You, 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 oh, yeah. 
you're drawn to that. You want to watch the train. Ooh, look, the train's about to wreck. Ooh, ooh, I can't take my eyes away, you know? And, and yeah. I think I think some of those, uh, that's what that's what we fight against is that, mm -hmm. and I don't mean like in, you know, ah, but it's, that's. Well, sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> It's like it's like my stepdad used to say to me. He says, uh, "Don't don't wrestle with a pig. You get dirty, and the pig likes yeah. it." You know? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's a, that's exactly yeah. it. As yeah. uh, we just saw recently, <laughs> yes. the pig likes. It. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, that is also the uh, added benefit between uh, Curtis and Dean and myself. I think if anyone were to get into a fist fight with us, we have a pretty good chance. Uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, actually, some people were. <laughs> the only people I'm actually worried about is uh, enough. Just because uh, I follow some of them on on Facebook. The people who work on the Comicsology originals are also very into martial arts and boxing. <laughs> really? That's cool. So I'm like, all right. So if we're gonna okay, I'll fight these publishers, but maybe not you guys. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta pay the um, so don't be acting up. Yeah. yeah. But, um, and and kind of you know like you're mentioning, uh, that is uh, one of the things you have to think about when you're considering your marketing strategy is market bloat. Mm, yeah. uh you know if our, our, our pre-sales are on kickstarter if someone were to go to kickstarter and type in comic <laughs> how many people are happening in any given day uh, so many so part of the reason why i'm wanting to convert the online presence to be more like inbound marketing is i want people to go from silverline to the kickstarter not from the kickstarter to silverline because that that feels like a losing battle <laughs> yeah but yeah, people but, but people are, are are looking like how do i get better making comics how do yeah. i dis what is blank why is blank and we pop up there we build enough trust they don't want to subscribe to our newsletter they might follow that newsletter through to buy something from us because they trusted us first yeah and so that that's uh one of the benefits of it, of, of content marketing as well as you know you then have the additional challenge of it's not just creating eye-catching posters it's creating content <laughs> yeah 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 definitely and I, I think, I think it's it's a big thing is when you have that direct dialogue with yeah. people. Before there was actual press people that would actually tell mm -hmm. the, the celebrity or the creator what to say, right? And how to say it and what edit it. And now there's no filter, just straight through. Yeah. So, so you know, you really got to pick the right people for the right. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, definitely, definitely. Good stuff. All right. Uh, so we are wrapping up in the last uh, 20 minutes here. Um, uh, final thoughts on marketing, visual content, personality. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, Quentin's been working away. Uh, Quentin, what have you been working on as well? If you can get a mention of that so we might get some potential future spoilers. Well, uh, I can share my screen I was, yes, yeah, I was about to say why haven't you been sharing your screen <laughs> uh i kind of didn't want to reveal it uh oh is it secret is it, it, is it, secret? Is it safe just i'll share it for just a moment Ooh. okay yeah and then it'll be gone okay. 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 so so we should only open our eyes briefly Curtis yes <laughs> um where we go? I mean, <laughs> screen capture. Screen screenshot. Screenshot. Oh my gosh, that's oh, awesome! That's so good. Look at that. That is badass. That's so sick. Wow. wow. I, love it. I love it. Yeah, that's what I've been uh, doing while y'all been uh, talking. Uh, but I've been en enjoying it though. I mean, it's gorgeous. Yeah. Gorgeous. It's coming along. It's coming along. It's nice. Very nice. I'm just putting the finishing touches on it, trying to get the atmospherics right and stuff. But, yeah. Sweet. Nice. Beautiful. Okay. Yeah, Got to go see, away now. I see the subline paper up there, but I don't I don't see a, a, a title or page number or anything up there. Is oh, what this I think is. is? Uh, oh, my goodness. I've been so far, so deep in the world, I've uh, forgotten the name. Oh, it's uh, Night Rise. Sorry. Okay, yeah, that's what yeah. I thought it was. Nice. Yeah. Nice. There we go. Yeah. Night Rise, Mackenzie Workman. I was going to say, if Mackenzie's watching, that. you know she's squealing. Oh, yeah. It's like she's just seen Hayden Christensen. Uh, <laughs> yes. She loves that Hayden Christensen. Boy, Christian. doesn't she, though? I'm telling you, I, I almost hide her sometimes. I'm like... I do not need to see any more Hayden Christensen. 
<laughs> right. uh, closing thoughts on, on marketing, Hayden Christensen, uh, what have you. Yeah. More Hayden Christensen. <laughs> yes, right. Yeah. Quentin, as, as, the, as, as the artist for uh, Nightfall, is she constantly telling you that the character has to look like Hayden Christensen? Or are they all like... Yes. <laughs> no, I haven't heard that yet, but uh, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Whenever I start doing them quite a bit, you know, she might start trying to steer me in that direction. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> make make the good guy look like Hayden Christensen. Yeah, yeah, there you go. More like Hayden. <laughs> now, I think. I think. Um, I don't have any super final thoughts. I, I just think it's it's um, it, it's a really great art art form. Marketing is a great art form. Um. And if you actually, here's one thing: if you want to see, read a really creepy book, it's out of it's out of print, but read a subliminal seduction. Oh Ooh. yeah, that sounds yeah, that, good. Yeah, that that's the book about how all the hidden imagery and uh, things within the advertisements. And this is, goes back to the, like the '60s and, and further back. It's out of print. I have a copy, but um, uh, Stanley Kubrick used it for a lot of the stuff that he does in his films, including The Shining. Mm -hmm. so, really, subliminal seduction. It, it'll it'll mess you up if you read it because. Yeah. You realize how easily we're manipulated. Yeah. Oh my goodness! Yeah, yeah. And I'm just gonna scary. About that while I use my iPhone 10X mm -hmm. with a beautiful bevel display and liquid yes. it's amazing. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, and people and people laugh at me. People people say, "Well, you ain't got no cell phone. Right? You, would you have a thing against technology?" No, I don't have anything against. It. I like technology. I just don't want to carry a dead gum cell phone around with me everywhere. Yeah. When, when, the, when the machines uh, reach singularity world and you'll be the only one surviving. So. I know. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, there's also another like really interesting thing to look at was, uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, the, the fang world or the modern American economy, the first ones to really master personal driven marketing was Apple with Steve Jobs giving his annual press conferences. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely. So, so here's a uh, here's here's a question for you, Tim. What kind of marketing is it? Where, um, all right, let's talk about. So, Curtis, you still got your phone handy, all right? So let, let's talk about um, let's talk about hot rods and sports cars, and see if Curtis's phone picks up on the hot rods and sports oh, cars, yeah. and see if he starts getting ads about oh, that. Yep. That's yes. I, Isn't yep. it creepy? That's no, super uh, creepy. Actually, it happened to me recently. Um, my wife and I were talking about my mother-in-law moving some of her stuff for her. Mm. We're not moving anywhere. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, and I kid you not, I, kid you uh, not, I have ads for moving companies on Facebook. Uh -huh. That you that you'd never saw before, right? No, that, like, yeah, and, and I never saw them before. I have, I have no, no intention of moving. <laughs> but, but because we talked about moving stuff for my mother-in-law, yep. I'm getting inundated with ads for moving and boxes. And uh, the first time someone I heard someone say that, I said, "That's just crazy that dude, your phone's not listening to you and all that kind of stuff." Yeah, but I can't remember what it was. It, I can't remember what it was, but I had a conversation with Tommy about something. We were talking about blah 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 blah, mm -hmm. and the very next day, I come up at my computer, Facebook ads about that. I'm like, I have never seen that ad before in my mm -hmm. life. What are you doing there? And and I don't even talk. We were talking. I don't remember what we were talking about. I don't. Yeah. We were talking about something I never even talk about with Tommy. That's yeah. not unusual. If you have a conversation with Tommy, that's not unusual. You know, you talk about something you never talked about before. <laughs> you yeah. know, I, I'm going to try that out. Um, what are you saying, uh, Roland, about Tommy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Uh, so that is, I personally, I. It's what, what kind if of working is that. Yeah. So if you're working for a major corporation, that's all they talk about right now. I think it's super scummy. Uh, my employer thinks it's super scummy. <laughs> you're, if you work for a company, they should think it's super scummy. But uh, that is uh, uh, AI-assisted target uh, uh, target demographic blasting. Oh my uh, gosh! So, like an email blast where you have your target your that target demographic should. Is a, are the people who sign up for it and you blast some information? They have to willingly consent to it. This is just AI creates your target demographic for you, uh, and it is created by um, uh, tracking cookies. So, so, like every time you search something on Google, uh, you will get a cookie on your service saying that this IP address looked up this thing, which is why you should clear your cookies frequently, or use a secure browser like I use Opera because it uh, keeps them all your cookies in a cache and deletes them at the end of your session. Or use something like DuckDuckGo, which doesn't use any cookies at all. Um, 
I can also do a whole podcast on cybersecurity. Uh, that's a, a subject for another time. Maybe when we get to the geopolitics. Um, uh, but with your phone, so the weird thing is, so your phone microphone is not listening to you all the time. The data goes nowhere. It stays on your device, but your microphone has to be on because if you say Siri or something, um, right. it has to hear you to activate because, you know, voice assistance does have its uses. Like if someone is, um, you know, uh, disabled and is unable to use their hands or something, having a voice activate phone could be actually very useful for them. Yeah. But uh, it needs to be on in order to hear that. The data doesn't get stored offsite. It goes to your phone. But you're able to, that data can interact with those tracking cookies. Mm. So it'll say like, okay, these words were captured by the microphone that interacted with this Google search. How do we create uh, this package? And so um, uh, it, that that's how it ends up getting all convoluted and mixed together is because uh, t- data that should be separated is not actually separated and can interact and that influences something else. That's just creepy. And so uh, uh, nice thing is none of your personal information really goes anywhere. It's just right. a bunch of random ones and zeros that are like trying to, it's like uh, when your brain is like putting together, like you see two images and your brain puts together, like how comics work, you see two panels, your brain yeah. puts together the middle, the computer's seeing two things and puts together the middle. <laughs> uh, do y'all um, remember the, um, do y'all remember the uh, Burger King commercial? Uh, mm. where they where they um where they triggered all the Googles. Uh. There was there was a Burger King commercial. You can look this up on YouTube. Mm. And, and and the commercial was just like it, it was like I don't know, fifteen seconds. It was a picture of a Whopper or Burger yeah. King. Or I don't remember exactly what it was, right? But it was just like, Hey Google, what's a Whopper? <laughs> and it triggered everybody's Googles who had the television on. Oh, oh people really? were so, yep. oh yeah. Um. And I'm sitting there thinking that's brilliant. Wow. How can we do that, right? Yeah, no, it was genius, and then the SEC went after them. <laughs> oh, it made so many people mad because yeah. whenever that commercial came on, all the, these Googles were being triggered, and these yeah. people, the, the Whopper is blah, 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 all right. <laughs> well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do an experiment, and we're doing this on the stream, and I'll do it on all the streams I am for the coming month. Um, I'm going to see if we can play around with this. So um, I like zebras and eating baklava zebras <laughs> and baklava and we yes how that gets interpreted there you go. <laughs> yes. curtis is gonna get a, a, a facebook ads tomorrow with uh and you too can get uh, your zebra cooked medium well <laughs> yeah, exactly. just just every night before we go to bed just talking to your phone cat pictures cat pictures cat pictures <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that, that's already been happening, so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, so it's uh, essentially, and then people pay a lot of money to have uh, a tech firm create an AI that looks through the, that set of data and shoot their advertisement to platforms that match that IP address. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, I think now that I'm getting older, I'm getting ads where I'm just like, I do not have that problem yet. Why are You're you right. this? Yeah. Why is this showing oh. Oh, wait until you wait until you 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 pass a certain age, and you're you're gonna start getting uh. <laughs> it's, it's just never gonna use Google. Oh no! <laughs> Whoops! Head, headphones, headphones. <laughs> wait until you start getting uh, advertisements for cemetery plots and funeral homes. Oh, so, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Gosh. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. We yeah. we passed that birthday, and we're getting those now. We're like, <laughs> I'm not planning on dying yet. <laughs> uh, lower back pain. Yes, but shush. <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't need to tell them that I already, I've already got a plot. Yeah. There we go. It's in a nice, nice little hill uh, overlooking farmland in Arkansas. So there you go. Uh, my body is getting donated to science, and then uh, I, my, my friends are um, have specific instructions on what to do with the ashes. Um, they know what they are. <laughs> okay. Wow! <laughs> put, put them in the reprints of Wolf Hunter. Yes. <laughs> yep. Yeah. That's like a kiss did that, right? Talk about marketing. Yeah. Right? They put like supposedly put vial of their blood inside the ink. Yes. Um, I, I was I was watching a documentary on uh, Dave Geffen, and they, they they were talking about how I forget which musician, but this one musician that he was representing, she wanted like all these different things, and he gave her whatever she wanted. She wanted the lyrics in the album to smell like lilac. 
So they huh. infused lilac inside of the ink so that when you turn that page of the album, it smelled like lilac. Really? Wow. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Man, talk about money. I know. Yeah, I know, right? That's. And we, uh, I mean, you know, dumping blood into the red ink. That's yeah. not, I mean, yeah. <laughs> that didn't cost anything. Yeah, Gene, Gene, Gene could just spit it out if you wanted to. Uh, there, there, there's, a couple, there's a specific scene at the end of issue three of Wolf Hunter that we need to talk to Tommy about infusing that with black powder. So you can see <laughs> <laughs> it smell like black powder. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I tried to convince, uh, I was talking to Rory, and I tried to convince Rory that he and uh, Scott need to um embrace the 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 american patriot uh the, the revolutionary patriot look mm -hmm. and he needs to get him a big coat with some ruffles uh, <laughs> and the hat you know i'm like you know what? you don't have to worry about it. you can just wear blue jeans but it, you know if you get this coat that has some ruffles and you look like an yeah. american patriot and mm -hmm. you know you, you, people will stop and talk to you you'd be like a cosplayer so exactly yeah they'll yeah. want to take pictures with you yeah yeah I've already told Curtis that Curtis and I have already talked about it a little bit for your book too. Yeah, I'm going to be uh, doing cart cartwheels and no, I'm not dressing up as cat. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. Nah, <laughs> right. All right. Well, we have been that uh, show on Tuesday with some special guests. Uh, you can follow your normal horse hosts at the social media platforms mentioned below. I think I'm the uh, me and McKenzie are the only ones who are on uh, Twitter where you can find me mostly tweeting about Destiny and stuff. Uh, we also <laughs> are joined by Roland Mann and Curtis Fujita. Where can people follow you, sir? You? you can find me on all the socials. Uh, look, just look for Roland Man. I think I'm Man Roland on a couple of them, but uh, look for my look for my smiling caricature. Looks just like me. There you go. And uh, for me, you can find me uh, with all my social media links for my two separate interests. So for uh, martial arts, uh, my online kung fu school, it's tigercrane.net. That's for Tiger Crane Kung Fu. And for my comic book, it's uh, theshadowghost.com. And uh, if you're there, feel free to uh, subscribe to the mailing list so we can let you know as we get closer to the uh, finish line of this thing and getting it released. Queen, you mm -hmm. cool, you're uh, looking good, buddy. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've been working pretty hard. Yeah. Yeah. Look, look, look uh, good there. Made it past a uh, hundred pound loss. There wow. you go. Nice. Yeah. Hey, congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. My feet are thanking me. Oh, oh man. Your yeah. back too, probably. Huh? And, and yeah, and my behind having to sit in this chair all day uh, yeah. <laughs> doing artwork and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, how how long until the half marathon? What's that? I said, how long until the half marathon? Yeah, uh, probably <laughs> never. No, <laughs> I'm not a runner unless something's chasing me. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> it's got to be something really mean, yes. <laughs> really mean. Yes. Uh, uh, I'm I, kind of a fatalist. Well, <laughs> you'll catch me eventually, so I might oh, yeah. as well just get it over with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This body was built, uh, built for comfort, not for speed. Oh, yeah. so, there you go. Luxury yeah. brand. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I have recently rebranded my uh, Twitch as well. So that is now at Tim TK right at Tim TK writer on Twitch. Uh, I've dropped the handle. So now it's all unified. Cool. Uh, Quinn, anything coming up? Anything you want to promote? Uh, we have Trump's uh, book three coming up sometime soon. And uh, I think uh, four as well. Or is uh, three going with four? Mm -mm. No? No. Okay. Yep. So we have uh, three coming up. Also, I'm currently working on, uh, and as soon as work dry, dies down some more, yeah. I'll be pushing out some, you know, page after page of Night Rise, but that'll be in the future. So yeah. uh, the thing to look for uh, in the coming, the near future is the Trumps. Yep. yep. Number right. three. There you go. Well, again, we have been That's Everyone Show on Tuesday. Uh, check us out next week, 8 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. Same uh, silver channel, same silver time. Uh, you can also catch us, uh, not us, but another Silver Line crew on Wednesdays for Wednesday Wham, 8 p.m. Eastern, and again, 8 p.m. Eastern on Sunday for Silver Sunday. Uh, so we'll catch you next time, but until then, make my, make my line Silver Line. line. See you, everybody. That was a good show. Uh, Quinn, what you got going on later tonight? Uh, I don't know yet. I Hi, I'm Greg Horn. Make mine Silver Line.